here for you. He has a good point that the police Sweet tea and one is Cy for Cypress Creeker. <laughs> Mr. Watkinson has got for us now. <laughs> well, y'all drugged the morning out so long, Hank had a meeting, so I got to do this project for Hank. I'm sorry, did I say that out loud? <laughs> I would say I presume it's a retirement meeting, but uh, <laughs> probably might be, so I don't know. I don't know. know. You can explain that for me. <laughs> you got this? You got it? I'm ready. Whenever you're ready. I'd like to reconvene the February 25th, 2020 meeting of the Marine Resources Commission. <laughs> Next item on the agenda is Broadwater Seafood LC Oyster Planting Ground Applications 2017-111. Mr. Stagg. Uh, this is an application by Broadwater uh, Seafood LC, uh, received back 2017. Uh, they were requesting to lease approximately uh, 0 0.98 acres, or about an acre, of um, oyster planting ground in the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, it's located near the Seabreeze Apartments in the town of Cape Charles. Uh, it is protested by the adjacent property owner, and also the, uh, he's also the adjacent leaseholder. Um, so again, the project is located uh, in the town of Cape Charles on the uh, western shore, the, just of the eastern shore, <coughs> uh, a little south of Church. Again, you see the town of Cape Charles proper. Uh, the lease applications, that small red area at the end of the arrow there. <coughs> a little bit closer view showing CP's apartments locations near the end, of, just north of the end of Washington Avenue. So the lease does include the uh, area of the old ferry dock that was originally built in Cape Charles in the 1930s to take cars and passengers from Cape Charles over to Little Creek. Uh, the ferry terminal was moved into Cape Charles in 1933 um, and the abandoned facility. The water depths encompassed in the pro proposed uh, requested lease vary from approximately mean low water at the shoreline to about minus three feet as you go offshore. Um, the bottom is mostly sand inshore and a mix of sand and mud in the offshore. Uh, Trailstone Creek, which is nearby, is a, has a large amount of clam and oyster aquaculture, and there are active aquaculture clam beds uh, 1,400 feet to the northeast. Uh, even closer view, now you can start to pick up the, uh, the pilings of the old uh, hurry dock and, and associated infrastructure that's, of course, been abandoned and is in <coughs> some of a state of disrepair and uh, just kind of derelict type piling structures. Uh, let's leave that up for a second. Uh, Broadwater Seafood, the applicant currently has 20 leases that total of 400, over 462 acres with three on the bay side and 17 on the sea side of the eastern shore. Uh, the applicant in their application indicated they intended, if they get this ground, to use it for uh, growing uh, both oysters in cages and also aquaculture clams under nets. We received the Broadwater uh, Seafood application care of James Kelly IV uh, back in July of 2017 for about two acres. Uh, and this is the area we ended up 
actually surveying right here. Uh, it is bounded uh, by Greenpoint Aquaculture <coughs> Foundation's lease um, and Milo Water to the east. In response to our public interest review, we received a protest from Mr. Robert Schlegel and his son. They own the adjacent highland, adjacent to the old furry dock area. Um, and they had originally applied for the ground offshore in 2009. However, when we surveyed that, we excluded the area of the um, ferry dock and some area to the northeast where there's a somewhat failing bulkhead and some riprap uh, that has <coughs> kind of fallen, uh, some crap wrap we call it, uh, just kind of fallen into the water. We did not believe, even, even though they were the adjacent landowner, uh, that it was appropriate to lease where all these derelict pilings were and some of this other debris was in the water. So that was not included in that Greenpoint uh, lease uh, for, for that reason. In addition, uh, <clears throat> and they have protested the application of uh, the adjoining property owner. And they've also stated they believe if the area is to be leased that since they applied for it previously that, that they should have the chance to lease it now. In addition, they've also have some concerns with water access from their property and believe that they would not be able to do any beach nourishment if needed or install erosion control structures <coughs> without impacting this area if it's leased as oyster ground. So here's some ground shots uh, taken from the riparian property. As you can see, it is a quite extensive uh, field of uh, old pilings in this location. Uh, this is a little different view, looking back for the breakwater going in Cape Charles, uh, back towards the land, and again, uh, some of the uh, derelict pilings and some of the rock that extends over off the, uh, break, the uh, jetty there. This is obviously standing on the land, looking straight out. So, we, so the applicant did want to proceed uh, with the application. Um, I believe that they are here, and they'll give you a little more detail on their plan, but my understanding in discussing this with Hank is that <clears throat> some of the area is not encumbered by the pilings. It's sandy. They might want to try to do clam aquaculture and that they would actually use the existing pilings uh, to tether uh, cage aquaculture kind of in between the pilings. Uh, so that I think I've characterized their general <coughs> plan. <clears throat> so again, uh, we did not consider the remains of the old ferry dock as leasable in the past and did not include it in the Schlegel's Oyster Ground lease. Believing VMRC would not lease the area, the Schlegel's agreed to that configuration of the lease you see that wraps around this, this pending application and agreed to delete that area. We do believe leasing this area would create a conflict between the applicant and the riparian owner who accepted staff's word back in uh, previous application that the dock area would not be leased. <clears throat> This area would all, if we lease this area, it would limit the riparian landowner's access to some degree, particularly if cage or net uh, apparatus was placed in the area. But at the staff level, we don't have the authority to deny administratively a lease or to deny accepting one. So if the applicant is not willing to stake staff's recommendation here, which would have been to withdraw the application, we can only recommend a, a staff recommendation of course of action to the commission. So therefore, accordingly, after considering all the factors of 28.2607 and 1205 of the code and the concerns that have been raised by the protestant and adjacent landowner, we do recommend denial of the entire 0 0.9 acres as surveyed for broadwater seafood uh, as shown on this plat. I'd be happy to try to answer questions if I can. Uh, our surveyor that actually surveyed this, Daniel Faggart, is here. If you have any technical questions about the bottom, I think he's prepared to answer those. Okay. Any questions of Mr. Stagg? Uh, Mr. Tankard. Uh, Mr. Stagg, you mentioned in your testimony that we stated that we would not lease this area. You stated that to the Schlegels at Greenpoint. I believe that at, back in 99 when they applied, we, was, we were surveying it, that, and Hank was here then. I have to take his word that that, uh, that that was what we indicated to them. And they understood, I think, the rationale and agreed that they were fine with that. They'd accept the configuration you see here of the, of the lease to the north and east and west. I just wanted to double check that. That's, that's okay. That, that's my understanding. Great. Further questions? Thank you, Ben. Mm -hmm. 
Is the applicant present or represented? Yes, sir. Would you come forward, please? <coughs> Good afternoon. George, right here. Yeah. Showing us where the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you, God. I do. You state your name for the record, please. James Arthur Kelly, the fourth. Yes, sir. Proceed, please. Um, the reason I applied for this piece of ground was because I was denied a piece in Nassawatis Creek, of, I guess, three years ago or more. So I just went looking for more land. Uh, I didn't come in here to start a problem with, uh, with some poles or anything. But it just looked uh, a good piece of land to me. Um, I checked. I did a checklist so I wouldn't be coming here for no reason. And I just said it has no eelgrass. It's not a bathing area. Other leases have been uh, approved surrounding me. It's a boating area. Do people fish there? No. Is there? Is it a boating area? No. Um, I guess I should have answered my questions as I went. Is it a bathing area? No. Uh, have other leases been surrounding me? Been approved? Yes. Uh, does anybody live shoreward? And I go, no, no one's ever lived there. It was, uh, my understanding, a spoil area. Uh, I talked to George Savage. I don't know, George might be pushing 90 or something. He can't rem ever remember it being used. So I go, why shouldn't I apply for this? It meets, it checks off everything that I've historically known for y'all to oppose. <clears throat> and so that's the reason I'm here. Okay. And I wouldn't use it for clams, but I would use it for oysters. And yes, the poles, while they might seem a hindrance, they're kind of like an advantage to somebody in the worship business to tie cages off to. Let me ask you a question. Um, Kelsey, um, Ms. Block, this area, I would presume, is a former VDOT right-of-way, correct? Would it be, or was that a, do you want to, or it did, Mr. Taggart, do you have to, is it a private pier? I mean, was it, was it, was that ferry a VDOT, or is any staff know? I have no earthly idea, sir. Thought that was like a spin. It's looked the same in my in my whole lifetime. Okay, I just didn't know the you know he's talking about tying things to it. If it's you know, I just didn't know whether V dot is, I mean, is given. I would think it's been a long time, and I don't know how that works. But yeah, I theoretically uh, ownership doesn't just vanish. Um, I don't know of any mechanism by which if someone owned those piers, whether or those uh, poles rather, that we could or someone else could claim ownership of them. I would have to look and see if there is some okay. mechanism, but that I think I'm not, yeah. would, would be a potential issue if he's going to tie stuff to them. If the owner showed back up and yeah. I don't I don't want to I don't want to rain on the application right off the bat. I'm just asking that question from a technical perspective because yeah. I that doesn't make any I haven't you know that's not a Yeah, I mean I can't any. I can't say how likely that would be, but it's been a long time. I do know yeah. that. Well before yeah. the thirties. Well before the thirties. Yeah. I think Hanks in his valuation says it 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 very moves from the where you see those pilots to um, the harbor area uh, at Cape Charles in 33, and then of course, then we got subsequent ferry well, docks. Like I said, that's a long. I don't. I don't want to make an issue out of something that's not. But I just when so I saw yeah, those, and that was a ferry. Um, I've known people that have had to deal with VDOT as far as transferring. For example, you go to Smithfield Station, where some of their property is. Um, that's the old roadbed for the old South Church Street, and I, I, it's it was a it was a complicated process to get that transferred from public to private and things like that. That's why I'm yeah. just bring up the question. So. I mean, if, if there is like a VDOT right of way, like an easement, that's a different question that could be yeah. uh, more popular. Anyway, that's just it. Any further questions for the gentleman? <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Anyone else here in support of this project? Anyone here in opposition to this project? The yes, Slagos are not here. Hank said they weren't here earlier, so they did. They did submit an opposition to it. I saw. Yeah, I read that. Um, now, it's my understanding they own the property now, so I, I would assume they have the riparian rights here adjacent to the property. I looked up the history of the ferry, but it's pretty convoluted, so I'm not even going to try to attempt. Okay, don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay, matters before the commission. Uh, Mr. Zedrin. Uh, 
One thing uh, that this brings to mind, uh, during this past month, I talked with uh, Senator John Cosgrove from Virginia, and, and I suggested to him that, you know, we have these situations come up where people want to lease to the shoreline, and that uh, uh, maybe it would be appropriate to have some legislation that would uh, guide us in that. And he told me to, to ask the board here, give them the guidance, and they'll put it into the laws because they know nothing about what we do. And here's one of these cases right here, right up to the shoreline. And, and uh, uh, you know, I got a problem with the, our agency. Uh, somebody puts in for an application to the shore, and they say, no, we're not going to do that. You know, that for whatever reason, whether it's a, uh, um, a uh, ferry or this or that, whatever reason that we have for saying, no, you can't do that. And then. Can't, can't do what? Put in an application or. or Lease it. Oh, lease it. Okay. Like those other guys, they, they had it running all the way to to the shoreline, and then somebody a couple of years later <clears> comes by and say, "Oh, we're going to lease that," and, and then then we're here. Uh, I don't think that's right, and I, I agree with, you know, uh, with the staff recommendation here that uh, uh, first of all, I don't agree leasing to to the shoreline to start off with, but uh, that if anybody should lease this, it should be the people who ask for it, and so. Uh, I would have a motion. After Please proceed. After discussion to uh, uh, approve staff recommendation, to deny the application. Motion made by Mr. Zedrin to approve staff recommendations. Is there a second to the motion? Second by Mr. Tankard. Further I discussion? Didn't second. I didn't second. I'm sorry. I've had my hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Proceed. Um, I was just going to have a comment, uh, but I think if we got a motion, I, I was. Okay. Uh, Not a problem. Is there a second to the motion? I'll second. Second by Dr. Neal. Now, further discussion. Mr. Tankard? Uh, yeah, well, Mr. Kelly's a known entity in our neck of the woods. He does a good job. He's known for being a good steward. I mean, if there's a person we'd like to lease to, certainly he would qualify. You know, however, when we say in 2009 to the Greenpoint uh, company, uh, the Schlegels, that we're not going to lease to them and then turn around and lease to someone else, it's, it's problematic. So I, I just mentioned that. I, I feel for Mr. Kelly. I think a good man like him needs to have more ground. But at the same time, it's, I think to have a double standard is kind of difficult for this commission. <clears throat> Further discussion? Mr. Frank, I'm sorry, Ms. Ms. Lusk? Yes, um, I just would like to echo Mr. Tankard's thoughts. Um, I certainly understand the challenge of finding suitable ground. Um, that's, that's something that's come up here multiple times. Um, but another thing that's come up is situations in which um, pe ground, people have applied for ground that's been denied and then someone else comes. And, and applies for that same um, ground. And, and I agree, I think it's important to be consistent. And so- um, Kind of rough on the credibility, isn't it? Yeah, it, it, it's a tough situation for everybody, but in this situation, um, I would support Mr. Zedrin's motion. Further discussion, Mr. France. Yes, uh, when we do something like this and have had multiple people apply, first one denied, and we don't know what's gonna happen with this one yet, but if something like this has been denied again, is this something that we can make unleasable? Go ahead. So I was going to bring that up, maybe if nobody did. Uh, and Mr. Francis is correct. We've had this situation a number of times where we had it in the James River. We've had a number of places where people have applied. Um, this one's a little different. I mean, most of the time when they've applied, it gets protested. It comes to the commission. The commission denies it. And that's all they do. They deny it. And a year, four years, five years later, someone else comes in and applies for the same ground. It gets protested again. It comes to the commission. At staff level, we've been trying when this happens to give the commission, even in our recommendation, uh, a potential uh, secondary recommendation that if, if you're going to deny the lease, maybe you want to designate it as an area that not to be leased. And we will, we will put it on our map and identify it that way. At a minimum, I think with this case, if you just deny it and that's all you do, I still think, in my opinion, as chief of the engineering department, that we would put a note on the map that this area was denied by commission action. We have that on some of our other maps related to other things the commission had done related to encumbering an area. Um, but you do have the option of, of actually, you know, in the motion or a second motion, however you want to do it, you know, saying that the commission's gone on record as this is an area that we should not lease. Doesn't mean someone couldn't come back five years from now in public comment period or and say, 
I'd like to raise this issue again before the commission. You could reverse your decision, but it would give us a little more power at the staff level. If somebody comes in, we can say, the commission <coughs> has said this is, we wouldn't even accept an application. We'd say go to the commission at a regular meeting and ask to have this issue reconsidered, but I think we wouldn't take an application then. So um, that is an option. And, and quite honestly, that's only fair, number one. It also reduces staff time, number two, um, because that's, it, it just and it, wouldn't. And to be honest, it helps staff. Hank and I have both been here a long time, but you know this could be forgotten. If it's not put on the map, and Hank and I are both gone two years from now. That's not allowed, you're out of order. <laughs> I'm sorry. 10 years from now, when Hank and I are gone. <laughs> comment I um, I think it would be really helpful if it was possible to put a notes on the map that says this um, area has been denied by commission action in the future even um, regardless of what we decide to do about this piece of ground I think it would be helpful for people who are searching for ground and obviously um, helpful for staff to maybe reduce um, instances where have to go through the situation Mr. Zadrin? I, I approve her amendment to the motion. <laughs> and second it. All right. So, so clarify. Motion made to, to accept staff recommendations, remove it from uh, leaseability. Who seconded the motion? I did. Oh, okay. Dr. Neal. Does that amendment That's satisfactory true. to you? Yeah. All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Mm -hmm. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Thank you for your time and coming. Back to uh, public comments. Anyone here in the public that wishes to be heard on matters not on the agenda? They're seeing none. Next item on the agenda is item number 10, public hearing. Emergency amendment to 262010, Payne the Summer Flounder. Good afternoon. Good Commissioner, afternoon. Commission members. Should be easy peasy. Yep. If I can open it. Okay, this is a public hearing today, proposal to amend chapter 4VAC 20-620 pertaining to summer flounder to modify the landing dates, possession limits, and landing limits for summer flounder commercially harvested offshore and landed in Virginia. At the January 28th commission meeting, this issue was brought before you as an emergency amendment. Today's public hearing is to make permanent the emergency amendments that were adopted at last month's meeting. Um, this year for 2020, um, Virginia has allocated 2.4 million pounds of summer flounder. Um, staff works closely with industry every year to set trip limits and landing dates. Last month at the meeting, um, the regulation changes were approved by emergency amendment. The se spring season um, will run February 24, which was yesterday, through March 31st, and we have a landing limit of 12,500 pounds. No public comments have been received since the initial comment um, that was submitted from industry for the January meeting. Staff recommendation. Staff recommends the commission amend chapter 4VAC 20-620 pertaining to summer flounder to modify the landing dates, possession limits, and landing limits for summer flounder commercially harvested offshore and landed in Virginia. Thank you, ma'am. Any questions? All right. This is a public hearing. Anyone in the public wish to be heard? Pro or con? They're seeing none. The matter is before the commission for action. I move to approve staff recommendations. Motion by Mr. Minor to approve staff recommendations. There a second. So moved. Second by Mr. Tank. Thank you. Further discussion? All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Gear. Next item is item number 11, pertaining to commercial hook and line. Public hearing. Hi, good afternoon, Commissioner, members of the Commission. The staff through our regulatory review committee is going through a lot of our regulations this year, and we're trying to clean them up, make them more concise, make them more user-friendly. Um, so you're going to be seeing that over the next few months where we bring a regulation forward, and there may be very little regulatory change to it, but there'll be a lot of edits to it. There'll be a lot of, you know, when you see these coming forth, and one that we're starting with today is a public hearing for um, proposal for to amend 
Chapter 4, VAC 20-995-10, pertaining to commercial hook and line fishing, to modify existing language concerning time of day and area restrictions. This regulation was last modified in October 2018. It dealt with transfers and crew list requirements. Unfortunately, there was still some ambiguous language in there related to subsection B of section 30, which is under prohibitions, related to um, um, commercial hook and line fishing under uh, bridges, bridge tunnels, jetties, and piers uh, during open recreational striped bass season at Chesapeake Bay and the tributaries. It was meant to be closed on Friday through Sunday and on Thanksgiving Day and the following day after that, or Black Friday, so to speak. Uh, this is how the regulation is written now, and the ambiguous language is shown in right here where it says it shall be unlawful for a person to use a commercial hook and line gear or. So um, that's the problem we're having is that it, it's kind of indicating you can't hook and line fish during an open striped bass season. So pretty much what we're doing is we're just striking that out, taking that section out, and Section 30 of 4 VAC 20-995-10 under Prohibition Subsection B will read as, it shall be unlawful for any person to use a commercial hook and line within 30 feet of a bridge, bridge 300 tunnel. 300 feet. 300 feet. 300 feet. Yes, what sir. I say? 30. I'm sorry. 300 feet. I'm listening. <laughs> of any bridge, bridge tunnel, jetty or pier during Thanksgiving Day through the following day or during any open recreational striped bass season in the Chesapeake Bay and its tributaries except during the period of midnight Sunday through 6 a.m. Friday. So pretty much in those areas, on those structures, um, commercial hook and line is, is prohibited on weekends, which are Friday through Sunday during commercial striped bass season and on Thanksgiving and the following Friday. And so staff's recommendation, we've received no public comment on this, Staff's recommendation to the commission is to approve to amend Chapter 4 VAC 20-995-10 to modify language of Section 30, Subsection B, to prohibit the use of commercial hook and line gear within 300 feet of any bridge, bridge tunnel, jetty, or pier on weekends, Friday through Sunday, during open recreational striped bass seasons. I'll take any questions. Any questions? And for what it's worth, this regulation goes back probably 96, 97. It's back shortly after I came on in 92, so I know it's been there a long time. It just needs to be perfected. We're guessing somewhere along the line it, some word got dropped or something in there. Yeah. Any questions by members of the commission? Thank you, Mr. Gear, Chief Gear. Is there anyone here in support or opposition to this issue? Seeing that, the matter's before the commission. Move to approve staff recommendation. Second. Motion made by Mr. Taker and seconded by Mr. Minor. Further discussion? <laughs> to approve staff recommendation. All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Item number 12, lobsters. <laughs> 4 VAC 211010. Mr. Gear, I thought you were going to handle that one. How dare you? <laughs> lobsters. Good afternoon, Commissioner, members of the Commission. This is a public hearing on American Lobster. It's a proposal to amend Chapter 4, VAC 20-110, pertaining to lobsters, to establish minimum size of skate vents and lobster traps, and to modify link regulatory language for clarity. So ASMFC uh, implemented Amendment 3 to the American Lobster Fishery Management Plan, which created these lobster conservation management teams with industry. These submitted proposals to ASMFC to control effort and increase egg production in lobsters, and these were accepted in two addenda to Amendment 3. The first addenda incorporated measures from these LCMTs to control effort, and the second addendum addressed management measures affecting egg production following the release of a new stock assessment. So from these amendments, addendums, uh, ASMFC mandated some changes that were important in the protection of undersized lobster. So the first one required one rectangular escape vent with minimum measurements of two inches by five and three quarters inches, or two circular escape vents at two and a half inches. And then based on event selectivity study, they actually increased that minimum size for the circular escape vent from two and a half to two and five eighths. So as Mr. Gear um, was speaking about, we were tasked by the Regulatory Review Committee to clean up the language and regulations when amendments were required to make them easier to understand, easier to enforce, without changing the original intent. 
So if you've looked at the regulation, <laughs> you'll see that we've made some decent changes for lobster. And to try to make it easier to follow, we used um, two colors, a regulatory change, like the ones mandated from ASMFC, or something that changes intent or content is going to be in yellow, which you may have seen with his, it was yellow. And then any language change is not changing any intent is in brown. So to go through the regulation, on page one to two of the regulation and the definitions, we clarified some language in that brown color and then added a new definition for escape vent. It means an opening in a lobster pot designed to allow for the escapement of undersized lobster in that yellow color. On page two, uh, section 20, we struck some unnecessary language in that brown color, just to make it more clear. Proceed. Section 30, uh, pages two to three of the regulation, this is all just language updates to make it more clear. Um, and then section, or sub, subsection F, um, it was actually from a section 30 which was repealed and moved into this, into possession prohibitions, because it made more sense here. So again, no regulation changes. Section 40, um, just struck some language, make it more clear on page three of regulation. Section 50, this is the one that was repealed, so that was moved to section 30 on page three. Section 55, gear requirements. This has um, a decent bit of language updates, but also a new regulatory change with um, subsection B. All lobster traps shall have one rectangular escape vent with minimum measurements of two inches by five and three quarters inches or two circular escape vents at five or two and five eighths inches. Section, uh, yeah, section 60, commercial fishery permit requirements, just clarifying the specific permits we have in Virginia and subsection A and B, and then striking C. And then section 65, again, striking language uh, for clarity on pages five and six of your regulation. So again, none of these are content changes, just updates to make it more clear. Staff has received no public comments to date, and all of these ASMFC mandated changes complement federal regulations already in place. So the staff recommendation is to request, staff requests the commission to approve amendments to chapter four VAC 20-110 pertaining to lobsters to establish minimum size of escape vents and lobster traps and to modify regulatory language for clarity. And I can take any questions. Well, first can you, I mean, just since we're working on this and people are probably wondering why we're dealing with lobsters, can you give us just a little oversight as to how much lobsters or whatever we're dealing with or if, if, if you don't know, that's fine or whatever, but you Where mean they're like land? in Virginia? Mm -hmm. So I have this table. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that was not a setup, I promise. <clears throat> but that was good. <laughs> <laughs> so in the past two years, there's only been two reporting vessels that have landed lobster. There was a history of some higher, I mean, not really though, higher bounds of landings. Um, but it's really not, it's a smaller fishery, which is why we rarely open this regulation to start with, which is why we wanted to take it on to clean sure. up the language. Yeah, and believe it or not, uh, officers, do y'all still carry um, the lobster irons? Do y'all still have those? Don't know, don't have one in your back pocket? Not that I'm aware of. Yeah, used to, they used to be around, and you could actually go with the farm fresh and check to see if they were doing what they're supposed to have been doing or, or other, any other store, whatever. I have, I have a semi-related question. Dr. Neal. Um, what are, do we have any recreational regulations for lobster? Uh, not currently, as far as this regulation. Don't tell me you got them off your dock. I have, I have caught lobster. lobsters hook and line while well, talk talk fishing, so this time of year, and we've caught them, and we, our dive, recreational divers will get them around the wrecks, the triangle wrecks. And the recreational divers basically kind of self-impose their own regulations based on what they think the regulations are. Uh, they, don't, they don't keep buried lobsters. They, you know, they don't keep the females. Uh, there is some kind of closed season uh, yes. for commercials. Yeah. And so they abide by that, but I don't know that that even applies to recreational divers. Uh, they think it does, but I don't know that it does. Lewis is over there. <laughs> but there is a Lewis, come forth, please, sir. Get on record. I'm gonna, I'd like to hear this, too, because I don't remember. 
but honestly. There is an incidental catch that's allowed up to 100 per vessel, and that kind of covers dive boats and that sort of thing. They have to, of course, abide by all the size limit season and that sort of thing. But that's how that incidental catch. So the which recreational is, angler is under the commercial seasons? Yes. Everything else applies, but they're limited to 100. We haven't published anywhere on any of our documents or any forms. Or, I mean, I mean Gosh, maybe something. You brought up I've a, caught a good them. point. I've caught them, and, and my wife's ate them. And I don't <laughs> oh, you wouldn't. I understand. Well, I didn't know if it was legal or not. She didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, you know, so, you know, and I, and, you know, it's not a normal catch, but we do the catch on occasion. And, and, and so then... So I, I'd like to know what I'm doing is legal because y'all get mad at me if it's not. But well, when I say <laughs> recreational hook and line, it's so rare, I don't think it's stipulated, but there's an incidental boat catch that allows, that's how the dive boats operate, or someone that is diving. And maybe if it's more than a day trip, there's an extra allowance, but I don't think that really plays into the recreational part of it, but it may play into some of the other, like a scout boat, they may incidentally catch some lobsters. And That's probably what those numbers are there, I would think. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Neal, does that answer your, kind of sort of your question? Sort of. Well, 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 we probably, I mean, just extra two lines or something or yeah. somewhere as far as, that's a good point. Mr. Zedrin. How do you tell a female lobster from a male lobster? <laughs> I know about buried lobsters. Let's go down that road before we go the other road, please. <laughs> the buried lobster is very obvious. Yeah, and also females get V-notched. So even if they do not have eggs. You um, may want to explain to him what a V-notch is. is not for me, you may on not the know. tail of the lobster, they just clip a little V at the end of the tail. And so if somebody else picks up that lobster and it has a V-notch, by law, you're supposed to put it it's back. It's like a hole punch that goes yeah. in the back of the tail. Yep. Yeah. They notch it it. Doesn't I mean, I buy it. a lot of lobsters from a uh, uh, restaurant depot and they have just gobs of lobsters in, in their uh, in their containers over there and and uh, um, that's why I wanted to know what it looked like yeah. uh, well, if you're not v-notched you should be safe as far as the lobster is concerned so, right? yes. look they use a different uh, methods they scrub they'll scrub the bellies off yeah, of them to get the, they'll use Clorox on them before they've been done to do all sorts of stuff to get the eggs off the bottom of them so really weird stuff but yeah, if it's not v-notched you should be okay mm -hmm. not v-notched and no berries on it's you're, you're safe. Yeah. Let me know when we're having dinner. Um, <laughs> any of uh, this is a public, uh, um, Chief Gear. Um, um, I know we had some of the lobsters. Looking at the regulation itself, it, um, we do have a minimum maximum limit, and it doesn't pertain, it doesn't say commercial or recreational, so we can interpret that it means both recreational and commercial. Right, and the possession, possession pro, uh, prohibitions is the same. You can't have a buried female. And your question about how do you tell the male between a female, female, it's a lot easier if I had one here to show you, but the males have a small set of appendages on one of the walking leads called the potassium. It's pretty clear to tell if it's a male. The female's a little bit harder, but if we had one, I could show you, it would be real easy. <laughs> so. I'm sure he's got rubber bands on his claws, though, before you start poking yeah. around. Yeah. Anything else? It's the public hearing. Anybody wish to be heard on the matter? Pro or con? If not, let's move along on this one before we get in trouble. Move to accept staff recommendations. Motion made by Dr. Neal to accept staff recommendations. Second by Mr. France. Further discussion? All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Item 13. Okay, still Pertaining moved. to Jonah Crab. Yep. Okay, so this is a public hearing for Jonah Crab. Proposal to amend Chapter 4, VAC 20 1310, pertaining to Jonah Crab to establish. A 2.75 inch minimum claw size for claw specific harvest greater than five gallons to establish a definition of Jonah crab bycatch, to modify non lobster trap possession limits, and to modify language for clarity. So, the fishery management plan allowed, original fishery management plan allowed for a commercial harvest of claws from New Jersey to Virginia due to the smaller vessels not being able to store the whole crab on board. Addendum 1 increased the bycatch allowance for all non-trap gear, and then Addendum 2 established a coastwide standard for claw harvest to address, address inequities in the states that weren't included originally, Maine and New York, in the first fisheries management plan. 
And then addendum two, also defined bycatch in order to prevent the creation and expansion of a small scale fishery. So those mandated changes from ASMFC are that non-trap bycatch limit, uh, which is 1,000 crab incidental bycatch limit for non-lobster traps uh, to trips of any length. The claw harvest, so it's a 2.75 inch minimum claw size for claw specific har harvest greater than five gallons. And then uh, to define bycatch, which is Jonah crab caught under the bycatch limit must comprise at all times an amount lower in pounds than the target species the deployed gear is targeting. So again, just like with lobster, the um, regulatory, regulatory changes are in yellow and then the language updates without content changes in brown. So we added some new <coughs> definitions to make it clear of how to measure the claws, since that is one of the additions from ASMFC. And then uh, the target species definition is also um, included in that necessary change from ASMFC. That's on page one to two of your regulation. <coughs> Section 30, uh, some updated language. And then subsection D is that claw harvest from ASMFC, it shall be unlawful for any individual to possess or land for commercial purposes any Jonah crab claws that measure less than 2.75 inches in claw length and any amount greater than five gallons. Section 40, um, we broke this out into some new subsections to make it more clear in that brown um, the brown color. Then we updated the incidental bycatch limit up to 1,000 Jonah crabs and then added subdivision three to define um, target, the targeting bycatch fishery. So it shall be unlawful for any individual to possess any Jonah crab caught under the Jonah crab incidental commercial permit unless the weight of the target species on board the vessel is greater than the weight of the Jonah crab in that individual's possession. <coughs> Section 40, subsection B is just, again, we broke out that paragraph into um, subdivisions to make it more clear and easier to enforce. Pages three to four of the regulation. Section 40, subsection C, same story, um, just changing the language to make it more understandable. This is a lot like lobster, where we don't open it that often, so there's a decent bit of changes to be made. Just a minor change in subsection, or yeah, subsection D. And then section 50, just removing some language there for clarification. And also that's the recreational limit for Jonah Crab right there. So staff has received no public comments to date and this complements federal regulations already in place, just like with lobster. So staff requests that the commission approve amendments in chapter four VAC 20-1310 pertaining to Jonah Crab to establish a 2.75 inch minimum claw size for claw specific harvest greater than five gallons, to establish a definition of Jonah Crab bycatch, to modify non-lobster trap uh, possession limits, and to modify language for clarity. And I'll take any questions. Questions? You have another slide? I do. Let's see it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not active. <laughs> Further questions? Thank you. So public hearing, anyone in the audience wish to be heard pro or con on this matter? Okay, if not, the chair will entertain a motion. And to approve staff recommendations. Motion made by Mr. Minor to approve staff recommendations. There is a second. Second by Mr. Franks. Further discussion? <coughs> All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Next item is public hearing pertaining to the taking of bluefish. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay, so this is a public hearing for a proposal to amend Chapter 4, VAC 20-450, pertaining to the taking of bluefish to revise the recreational possession limit for bluefish. Um, so in August 2019, an update to the stock assessment found that bluefish are overfished, but overfishing is not occurring. So in October 2019, the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council and Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission adopted a coastwide recreational harvest limit of 9.48 million pounds for 2020 and 2021. And this requires a coastwide reduction of 28.56% of uh, recreational harvest. 
So following this, in December 2019, the council recommended and ASMFC approved a three fish bag limit for the shore private and rental sector and a five fish bag limit for the for hire sector. Uh, so in Virginia, um, this is a figure showing the bluefish harvest per angler per trip. Um, all of these trips had bluefish indicated as the primary target species. Um, and here we see that from 2006 to 2018, most of those intercepted trips reported a harvest of three or fewer bluefish. Um, now looking at the reductions for Virginia based on the um, ASMFC recommendation, um, for the shore, rental, and private, if we go to three or fewer um, fish bag limit, that encompassed 93% of the trips in 2018 and 94% over a three-year average. So we're only really going to be affecting uh, six to seven percent of those trips. And for that sector, we'll be achieving a reduction of 23.5%. And then looking at the for hire sector, if we go to that five fish bag limit, again, we're only affecting about six to seven percent of those trips. And for that sector, we're uh, um, achieving a 10.2% reduction. So if we do the three fish bag limit for the shore rental and private sector and a five fish bag limit for the for hire sector, we will achieve a 20.8 reduction, um, which is uh, smaller than the coastwide 28% reduction. But um, since it's a coastwide reduction, each state might have some varying um, numbers there. <coughs> um, so for the regulation, we uh, made some additions to um, section 15, um, adding definitions for captain and charter vessel or for hire vessel. And then um, looking at section 20, subsection A defines the um, bag limit to be three fish for the recreational uh, fishery, except for what is specified in subsection B, which um, specifies a five fish bag limit for uh, charter or for hire vessels. And then subsection C simply um, states the bag limit based on what sector and um, how many people are on the vessel. Uh, so staff hasn't received any public comment. Um, so staff recommendation is the commission approve amendments to chapter 4 VAC 20-450 pertaining to taking of bluefish to revise the recreational harvest and possession limit of bluefish such that the harvest and possession limit is three fish for the for the shore, rental, and private sector, and five fish for the for hire sector. And with that, I can take any questions. Questions, Mr. Zedron. Go back to that uh, regulation. Uh, um, is that like on a charter boat? It says it shall be unlawful for any person fishing from a charter boat, and so that's per person. So each person can have five bluefish. All right. And can the captain have five? Is that, can he no. add to that? Be, you know, you got a captain and a mate, so you, you take out six people. So six times five is 30. And can you didn't take five for the captain and five for the mate? Yes. OK. Thanks. Yeah. Got a fish fry. Further questions? Anyone in the audience pro or con on this matter? We should be heard. Seeing none, the matter's before the commission. Motion made by Mr. Minor to approve staff recommendation. Is there a second? Second by Ms. Lusk. Further discussion? All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? No. <laughs> okay. And I, and I can give you the whole long and passion reasoning why sector separation is bad for the recreational fishing industry and why it's a wrong-headed approach that the federal government and the council seem to want to take, but just pretend they already did that. Thank you. Right. I would like to thank uh, the Regulatory Review Committee for all their hard work. That it, let me tell you, how many is on, in, on that committee, Pat? It depends on the week. I mean, it's, it, we, as many as you can get in that room? Yeah, pretty much. <clears throat> these guys sit in there sometimes two and three hours at a time pouring over these regulations. Um, 
and obviously um, no one in there is an attorney but they do a pretty good job as far as getting the regulations right so I just wanted to take this opportunity from a commission perspective to thank the regulatory review committee for all their hard work so with that we're on item number 15 oyster replenishment plan <laughs> Button. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Commissioner and members of the Commission. All right, this is a, um, a discussion item uh, for the 2020 Oyster Replenishment and Restoration Plan and the associated procurement procedure. So that's that important component of this plan. Um, I'm going to run through sort of the, the background and then go over where the funding for this plan is coming from. And then I'll walk through with sort of the individual projects. Um, feel free to interject if there's uh, any questions in between, um, but I'll, I'll probably answer them as we go along. And for the record, our Chief of Administration and Finance, Sherry Crocker, has joined us to make sure that the procurement matters uh, don't slide by me. So therefore, proceed, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> um, so the implementation of harvest effort controls and an effective management strategy have uh, really led to a sort of consistent public oyster harvest for really the last five years or so. Um, we've sort of gone up substantially uh, from the early days in, in 2000. Um, and we're actually, right now, the five-year average of the public ground harvest is very similar to the much longer-running public ground harvest going all the way back to 1957, 1958. So the five-year average is right around um, 255,000 bushels from public ground. And that long-term average going back all the way to the 50s was actually just 257,000 bushels. Um, so we're actually, the public ground harvest is pretty close today to where it has been historically. There have been some substantial ups and downs over that time, but the long-term average, we're, we're in pretty good shape where we are right now. Um, <clears throat> although, uh, part of that long-term average coming up to where we are now, part of it is related to the oyster resource recovering. We've been putting in a lot of work for, for decades now into uh, restoring and replenishing public oyster grounds. Um, and you can actually see that the population of oysters has recovered um, during that time frame. But also the gear efficiency and harvest effort has gone up at that same time frame. So as oysters recovered, more people came to the fishery and hence more oysters were harvested. This is actually a, a long-term landing going all the way back to the 1880s of landings and millions of bushels of oysters. Um, you can see that a lot of these, when millions of bushels were coming off of uh, oyster grounds, this is public and private combined, a lot of what was going on was seed transfer from private public ground to private ground. So there were hundreds of thousands of bushels of seed moved um, to private ground and reported as market harvest. And that's when you're getting in these multi-million bushels of landing. So the public harvest was higher, but a lot of that harvest on private ground started out as seed oysters on, on public ground and was transferred. This is again when the oyster disease took off um, and really that was when the decline happened with, with disease. And again, this is when that sort of recovery in the 1990s uh, started to where we are today. <clears throat> Um, a lot of that harvest is dependent on um, the current today's harvest on public ground is related to um, past year spat sets and also the whole fishery both public and private is very interconnected. This is an actually a, a longer term look at uh, there's an attachment that shows the breakdown of traditional versus wild harvest. So this goes back to that 2000 time period what you see in gray is the number of bushels that make up the total harvest coming from public ground there. What you see in yellow is broken down by calendar year through our mandatory reporting system. We can look at um, the amount of harvest coming off of private ground that's caught using traditional gear types, so scrapes, dredges, hand tongs, that sort of thing. Um, and that's that yellow portion there. And this brown portion is, is sort of, there's sometimes a common misperception that a lot of private ground harvest is all hatchery based. So this is actually going back onto our, our miniature reporting and this is the part that's actually containerized and based on the gear that's harvested is pretty likely to have been started in a hatchery. So the reality is that still even today the majority of oyster ground harvest is coming primarily through natural recruitment. You can really sort of see that they go up and down together and a big reason for that is that water quality um, events such as 2018 where water quality was really poor affect 
all aspects of the fishery, and they all really support each other. And that's one of the reasons that for a long time now, both public and private fisheries have sort of fluctuated together. A lot of the factors that negatively impact one um, also negatively impact other and vice versa. <clears throat> and they all sort of support each other and provide different types of product at different times so that the oyster fishery as a whole is healthier when all aspects are doing well. And restoration efforts through improving spat sets and water quality help the public fishery, the private fishery, um, and all types of harvest there. <clears throat> So I touched on uh, um, the importance of spat sets, and I'm just going to go over some couple years of history here on where we have been on baywide spat sets on public ground. And part of the way, one of the most important ways that the Commission manages its public ground is try by replenishing the harvest areas and maintaining a certain level of shell volume on the areas open to harvest. And what that allows is actually physically room for oysters to attach to. So if there isn't a certain amount of shell on the bottom, literally there's not physically enough room for new recruitment. So because of that, we try to maintain a sort of a minimum shell base of five liters of shell per meter squared, and ideally a, a base of 10 liters per meter squared. And if you sort of visualize the, the podium here is about a meter squared, 10 liters of shell would be really just one layer of oyster shell thick. So it's not really that much, but by having that sort of minimum threshold, um, you actually have enough room to take advantage of spat sets when they do exist, and then two to three years later, that's when you can actually see those benefits coming in through the public fishery. So this is 2017, and you can see that the spat sets here, um, this is sort of an average year. Again, you can see this is, keep, a, keep an eye on the scale here. Um, this is the number of spat per square meter. This is that five liter threshold, and that's that sort of 10 liter threshold. You can really see you don't get into these high spat sets until you get sort of above a certain level of shell base in most years. So that was 2017. Um, <clears throat> 2018, as you recall, was the wettest year ever in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Um, and as a result, sort of the baywide average spat sets weren't great um, in most areas. There were a couple highlights where you'd still do see pretty good recruitment. Um, on recent shell plants, the fossil or reef shell that the replenishment department, the commission plants throughout the state, those areas um, in the lower James River, as well as some areas in the Tanger and Pocomoke Sound that had recent replenishment work, still were able to capitalize on that spat set um, and get decent numbers. There were some areas that did have good shell volume that still, just because of the conditions, didn't get um, that good spat set. But the good news was is because of those um, funding increases that we saw, um, <clears throat> a lot of those areas um, this year, in 2019, in addition with the increased funding and more replenishment effort that we did in the 2018 and 2019, we planted over a million bushels baywide on harvest areas throughout the Bay. That's about 30,000 bushels or so um, on one barge right there. We plant that in about four hours. Um, so that's a, a lot of shell going overboard, but we were well positioned to actually take advantage of one of the best spat sets um, we've seen in recent history in 2019. So we had a, um, the highest average spat set that we've seen in 12 years of our sort of con current monitoring, um, and it's likely a, a higher spat set, but sort of our monitoring methods were a little bit different, so we can't say that definitively, but I'm calling it the best spat set ever. Um, and, we'll we did, <laughs> and we did have, a, um, because of that increased effort, we were well suited. There was more acreages with at least that five liter threshold of shell on the bottom and even more acreages with that 10 liter threshold. Um, and then with this plan, we're, we're hoping to expand the number of acreages that'll be ready on the bottom should, should uh, we be blessed with a, a good spat set this year. <clears throat> so I'm gonna go through the sort of the funding sources. Um, I just wanted to highlight a little bit more background there um, on this funding issue is there was some funding really wasn't consistent um, for the replenishment department until uh, the fiscal year 13, 2013, and that was when the General Assembly appropriated $2 million for replenishment. Um, there's been a couple of increases since then in fiscal year 19 and 20, oyster funding in total for general funds was increased to close to, to $4 million. Um, and at that time, there was a, a budget language distinction that separated, separated replenishment dollars from restoration dollars. Um, and we've interpreted that as 
replenishment money, general funds are spent on areas that are open to harvest, and restoration funds are generally spent on areas um, that are closed to harvest or sanctuary areas. Um, VMRC, whenever possible, and our department, whenever possible, tries to, and we had some discussions earlier in the meeting on mobilization costs, that whenever we're in an area doing replenishment or restoration, wherever possible and feasible, we try to lower the per unit volume of, of cost. So if we're planting shell on a sanctuary area and a harvest area and in the same area, the mobilization costs for both are lowered um, and we can get more substrate deployed if we have a total larger project, be it replenishment and restoration. So an increase in replenishment funding will make our restoration dollars go further and an increase in restoration funding um, whenever possible will make our replenishment dollars go further and we try to combine those aspects um, wherever we can. Um, <clears throat> in addition to uh, those general funds, um, there's been a, 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 there's a budget request right now in the governor's budget, which we support, of um, $10 million. Right now, I believe it's in capital funds. Um, it, there's, there's some discussions underway. I've included that as in a portion of this plan. Um, again, it's sort of working its way through right now, but I wanted to include that, that funding source here. Um, and that's focused primarily on restoration and uh, um, on the 2014 Chesapeake Bay Act agreement, or Chesapeake Bay Agreement, um, which outlines sort of broad environmental goals for the Chesapeake Bay. And one of those outcomes, as outlined in the Bay Agreement, is for the con to continually increase finfish and shellfish habitat, water quality benefits from restored oyster populations, restore native oyster habitat and populations in 10 tributaries by 2025 and ensure their protection. So five of these tributaries are in Virginia and the majority of that, those capital funds or general funds would be focused on that. But again, wherever possible, we seek to sort of get the most benefit for the whole oyster fishery with all the funding there. So whether it's combining projects for replenishment and restoration purposes, um, but that's sort of the background on where that, that capital fund request is from. It's because Virginia is a signatory to this Chesapeake Bay watershed agreement along with all their commonwealths in the watershed, and that will help us to reach that, that goal there. Um, in addition to those general funds and that capital fund request, um, VMRC has been the recipient of a settlement fund, or settlement from DEQ related to a super fund site in the eastern branch, or it's actually in the southern branch of the Elizabeth River. Um, this was a settlement that was specifically uh, an oyster restoration project. It was part of a much larger settlement agreement um, related to some uh, an Atlantic Wood Superfund site there in the southern branch and this is an oyster restoration component so that's that million and a half dollars there. Um, in the past we've worked with Nature Conservancy at a number of restoration projects most recently Piank Tank on the seaside they'll likely have some funding available um, to put towards a replenishment plan this year that's where that 221,000 comes from um, Non-general funds, that's primarily from uh, uh, the special oyster funds, so the user fees uh, that oyster harvesters are required to pay. Um, those are the general funds that will be expended this year, and that's $150,000. And then BMRC has been able to pursue a number of federal grants through NOAA, um, and sort of this is an approximate there. They're sort of still working their way through the process. But over this year and the next two years, they should be approximately 500000 to $1.6 million. So this is a very substantial plan this year. Um, and I don't anticipate being able to s potentially implement 100% of all this funding in a single year. But I wanted to include sort of uh, the maximum amount of projects that we would likely be able to do in the 2020 season as part of this plan should funding fall into place. <clears throat> so that's where the money comes in. Um, and here's how we're planning on, on spending it. Um, <clears throat> so it's starting in the James River. Um, generally the cost benefit ratio for moving wild seed oysters has been relatively low. Um, so we get a pretty good return on shell planting, give or take seven to one back. Um, seed has usually been less than that. Uh, but over the last two years, staff has been working with the Shellfish Management Advisory Committee um, developing a, a, a plan to make that seed transport more um, cost effective. So we've developed a, a rotational harvest strategy similar to what PRFC has done in some areas. We've had better luck with the freshets than they have. Um, in three tributaries to the Potomac, the Acone, the Namanai, and the Ecomico, 
Um, the first two tributaries, the Yakamako and the Cone, uh, were planted in 2018 and 2019 with approximately 5,000 bushels. Uh, the first area should be open to harvest this year. Um, we'll be planning on planting approximately 5,000 bushels of seed taken from the James River um, in the Namanai. The seed that we're planning on moving this year will likely come from a, a shell plant that we've done in 2017, 2018, and 2019 again that received very high recruitment. So the hand tong areas that are normally where seed has gotten, where we've acquired seed in the past, um, it's usually more costly to, to pay a harvester to hand tong the seed, transport it by truck to these areas. And there hasn't been anyone interested in doing it for the price that VMRC is willing to offer or SMAC is willing to uh, um, support for moving that seed, but we've been able to work on this shell plant um, in the Nansman River and move seed from there. And it's been so cost effective that we've expanded that program um, last year to two other areas, the Rappahannock River and a portion of Pocomoke Sound that didn't get good spat sets. So we're planning on doing that again this year and are proposing moving 10,000 bushels to uh, areas seven and eight in the Rappahannock. Those are um, not in a rotation per se, they're sort of part of uh, a put and take fishery. So we usually like to put something back before we open those areas and they're historically sort of low recruitment. And then an area um, several miles from the uh, Vir Virginia Maryland line in the Pocomoke Sound. Um, we moved a small amount of seed there last year. All these areas we've checked are doing well. We're planning on, again on moving approximately 5,000 bushels there. Um, the approximate cost is $6 bushel and we're planning on moving about 20,000 bushels to those areas. So that's the proposed James River Seed. Um, the Piankatank and Great Wakamako River Seed Program, in past years we've managed a, uh, um, a little bit of a put and take fishery here where private individuals were allowed to harvest a, a quota set by the Conservation Plenish Department and SMAC um, and then were required to plant shell back. Um, due to low spat set and uh, low per bushel counts, there's probably not going to be a great deal of private interest in this program, and we want to allow these areas, they've started to recover with the good spat set, we want to give them a, a little more of a time to uh, come back before we open up or take a look at as they're re-implementing that, that management strategy. Um, in those areas, there is one seed area in the Great Wakamako that would support a limited amount of seed. Um, probably approximately 5,000 bushels, but due to sort of the small nature of it, I think we found that would be in likely the best public interest to transport that further downriver um, to areas that are open to public harvest, not just private ground, and then replenish that area. Since it's such a small program um, this year, that would sort of be the most, most benefit to uh, the greatest number of people there. Um, so we propose doing that in the uh, Great Wakamako River this year. That would be approximately 5,000 bushels. Uh, again, non-general funds, Primarily, the user fees would be used to support that work. Um, <clears throat> get on to the uh, the meat of the the program here. So again, um, this is a proposed shell planting. So public beds naturally degrade over time and lose their effectiveness as a substrate for uh, larval attachment. Um, usually, this process takes about three to four years to sort of natural conditions degrade that shell, and if there's not consistent recruitment. Those areas can degrade, harvest effort adds sort of a, a certain level to that degradement. Um, obviously, if you're removing living shells, they're not there to support future attachment. And we try to maintain that minimum five liter base, and ideally that 10 liter base if we can. Um, the areas that we're proposing to replenish this year, in total there's more than 1,000 acres that need replenishment that are under that 10 liter level. We're in better shape in terms of that five liter level. Um, and we are targeting some areas that have been recently opened to harvest. Um, likely those areas have, see a, a depleted level of shell. We're going to be in the area. Usually if we're in the area, it's more cost effective to go ahead and replenish those areas immediately after harvest. Um, it allows the full rotation cycle to come into play and they recover quickly that way. Um, so these are the areas, Tangier and Pocomoke Sound, approximately 200 acres, Great Wakamako. 65 acres, Rappahannock River, 178 acres, Piankatank River, 65, um, the Chesapeake Bay area, primarily Deep Rock, this is a Patent Tong area, um, approximately 128 acres, uh, the York River, 66.8 acres, and the Lower James River, 564 acres. And a lot of these areas, this would be sort of the maximum we would when we're, when we're actually have a final budget, have a final cost. Um, we'll probably trim some of these areas down. 
um, but this is sort of the, the maximum amount of acreage that we'd be replenishing in any of these areas. And this would be a combination of general funds for replenishment when we're working on harvest areas, likely general funds for restoration. We do maintain our, our sanctuary areas. If they're getting uh, naturally degraded, we'd like to keep those areas robust and healthy to provide um, additional larval transport. And they work as a good sort of natural comparison to make sure that we're managing our harvest areas effectively. We can compare moisture populations from the harvest areas to adjacent sanctuary areas to make sure that our, our management strategies are working, and that's why we also maintain those areas. And again, whenever possible, we'd seek to lower that per unit cost um, by replenishing and restoring jointly whenever we can. Um, we might as well use some of the DEQ settlement here in the Elizabeth River. Um, fine shells, which are sort of the shell fragments when we're actually doing our hydraulic shell dredging operation are retained by the contractor. In the past, we've been able to use these as a base material when constructing new areas, and it may be a cost-effective strategy to use a portion of that fine shell as a base and then put some alternative substrate on top of that. I'll touch on the alternative substrate project portion of the plan here shortly. So that's the proposed shell planting. Um, <clears throat> whenever possible, we're going to seek to plant the largest quantity of comparable shells for the lowest possible price. Um, and this would include a combination of house shells, so your shucking house shells, reef shells, as well as the dredge shells there. So shells, any shells that we can get that are of equal quality, we're gonna put the most overboard for the lowest price we can get for them. And that's, that's how we plan to proceed with the shell planting for this year. Um, as well as on the seaside of the Eastern Shore, I don't wanna forget the seaside of the Eastern Shore, very important, beautiful spot. Um, we've worked in the past with Nature Conservancy over there and in actually the last two years, I believe, um, TNC has actually done some replenishment work. So they've actually reshelled areas that are open to harvest. Um, they've been able to do that. And we've actually done some restoration work on sanctuary work. So a little bit of a, a role reversal with uh, the Nature Conservancy over there. And we're planning on doing, again, a, a, a project over there that would be a combination of um, funds from TNC as well as some restoration-specific funding on some areas open and closed to harvest on the eastern shore. Um, <clears throat> so this is the proposed alternative substrate areas. So for two replenishment plans now, there's been a proposal for work on the Pocomoke Sound, the Virginia State Line. The first year there were some permitting issues that caused basically permitting delays. We weren't able to get started um, until it would have been an opportunity to take advantage of every natural spat set. Um, the areas that were in question had some concerns about cross-border poaching. Um, and part of the proposal was to build a sort of large size substrate poaching resistant sanctuary that could provide brood stock to other portions of the Pocomoke Sound. Um, we removed any shell resource that was there, moved it further into Virginia onto the harvest areas. Um, the actual deployment on the state line didn't happen. Um, in 2019, all things were looking good. Then we had some staffing issues, various medical concerns came up. We were a little short handed. Um, and there was also some contra contractors that were sort of spread thin working on our expanded replenishment program and restoration programs. So that didn't happen. It's looking like the stars are aligning for this year, so we're going to go ahead and include it in this plan. There's funding available. The permits are in place. There should be some staff, possibly some more staff, so we're, we're hopeful to, to get that off. Um, in the Chesapeake Bay Deep Rock area, again, this would be harvest area. We like to have options just in case there is any sort of issues with the shell dredge that I'm sure folks here remember hearing about. Um, if something does happen, it's an older piece of equipment. We like to have some, some backup areas that are permitted for alternative substrate if for some reason the shells that we would normally be planting aren't available. So we have some harvest areas that are going to be permitted. That's an area of deep rock there. Um, two areas in the Rappahannock, area one and area two. These are sort of firmer, sandier bottoms where there isn't an existing a large amount of existing shell resource. Um, you can usually plant stone, alternative substrate, crushed granite, concrete, that sort of thing on areas you want to plant them on a firmer bottom. Um, oyster shells, you can sort of get into a softer bottom. They hold up on the surface a little more. But with this alternative substrate, you want to look for a sort of a harder, sandier bottom that can support that material. We've done some past planting on harvest areas. It's worked out quite well. And we sort of like to at least continue that to a small scale. And if there is an issue with shell, um, have the ability to scale that up. So we've had these areas permitted. Um, that includes another area in the Nansman River, um, or excuse me, the James River, the Nansman Ridge. 
Um, it's had good recruitment that would be suitable for uh, this as well. And then the restoration portion of the proposed uh, alternative substrate would be in the Elizabeth River Eastern Branch. This was that DEQ settlement. Um, it's approximately 20 acres or so there, and that could actually be counted as a restored tributary if that project is fully implemented this year. And then the majority of the alternative substrate restoration work would be focused in the Piankatank River um, using a combination of general funds as well as uh, um, the NOAA grant money there as well. <clears throat> so that is the proposed alternative substrate planting plan. And I, this is actually just sort of an overview. If there's any questions on specific areas, I can provide more detailed maps. I have, believe it or not, more than one backup slide. Um, but this just sort of gives you the, the scope of the replenishment plan this year. So this area up here is the Namanai River. That's where seed is going. Great Wacomico, primarily Shell. Um, Rappahannock River is here. Um, Tangier and Pocomoke Sound, Maryland Line right here. Uh, York River, um, this is a harvest area. This was actually an area that's been performing quite well this year. Um, they've been out there for a month, 80 boats working this area, getting a, a good limit every day after the area had been open to hand tong harvest for a month in, uh, in November. So this area has been holding up, but we're going to be in the area doing both restoration and replenishment work here. So we're going to reshell that area. Um, Eastern Shore, um, probably working around uh, Smith Island, Fisherman's Island area over there. Um, again, James River, Hampton Roads here, um, Nansman Ridge, and this is the eastern branch of Elizabeth River. So that's sort of the, the scope and scale of the replenishment program um, that we'll be undertaking. Um, the Shellfish Management Advisory Committee did approve um, the 2020 Oyster Replenishment Plan. There was one modification to the seed plant location in the Pocomoke Sound area. I believe SMAC had some concerns about the proximity to the, the Maryland-Virginia line, and they requested that um, staff form a subcommittee with SMAC to sort of look at an alternative location, did that. Um, and the oyster replenishment plan was approved uh, five, two, and two. Um, I believe SMAC was in favor of the substance of the plan, but there were some concerns um, on the, the breakdown between restoration and replenishment area, just there were some members that felt they should have increased replenishment along with the restoration budget. But I think they are understanding that the, uh, that the cost benefits and the, the benefits to all are mutual, but they were generally in support of the, the plan as a whole. Um, with that, I'll take any questions, but the staff recommendation requests that the commission approve the 2020 oyster replenishment plan. Um, and restoration plan as well as associated procurement procedures. Um, the Code of Virginia 282550 allows the commission to sort of set um, prices for certain things and allows uh, uh, a little bit different procurement procedure. So approval of this plan uh, would include the improvement of the procurement activity for the 2020 replenishment program. Okay. One question real fast. Sherry, we used to, Tony, y'all may remember, I thought the approval of the plan and the approval of the procurement were two separate motions. I believe that's how it's... I think, not completely, but, but that's what we're going to do. Because I do, I do remember that. I do remember it. So if, even if we're wrong, we've done it for two. Okay. Mr. Zedrin. Let me ask our counsel. Uh, this is on the uh, docket here for discussion, not a public hearing. So can we vote on it? I mean, I don't think it's necessarily something the public gets to. We got. We were talking about funds, public funds. Yeah, I mean, I think if anybody wanted to comment, they could come. Um, are you talking about notice? Right. I mean, this this is the, you see, you had all the public hearings ahead of time, and here you, you just have this is a discussion, so it doesn't tell the public that, that it's going to be voted over anything, but it's going to discuss it, and and, and you're. You deal with millions and millions of dollars in public money. I'm not, I don't think I have the answer to this off the top of my head. I know I've seen other boards that don't have like a full public hearing on budget matters. Um, it's not a public hearing at all, it's a discussion. Well, but. Depending on how, it, like, if it was 
uh, noticed, the fact that it says discussion on the agenda doesn't necessarily mean that you know we can't decide today. Um, there's other things to consider. Well, how was it noticed? It, and Go ahead, sir. If I may, um, in the past, it's it's been usually a discussion item. I think if it's a regulatory change, it requires to have the sort of two commission hearings is, is my understanding well, Other, well and that's kind of the reason I don't have the answer off the top of my head because this isn't a regulation and we have very clear procedures for regulations but in terms of budgets I mean a lot of budget decisions don't even come quite, before the commission that's what I was quite honestly so I, we've always brought this before the commission because it's of such a global and important matter that the commissioner himself has never made the overall decision without input from the commission. And the procurement matters are clearly set forth in the code as to how we do what we do. And what we're doing basically is just endorsing the um, utilization of the appropriate procurement matters, uh, methods used in the Commonwealth of Virginia. That's based on what I recall after. Right, and I mean, if. If there's nothing in the statute that says the commission has to make this decision, the commissioner could do it, um, which means it, it wouldn't need to come here at all. It's, it's, it's similar to when we bring forth the Recreational Fishing Advisory Board issues, and we approve those. We'll do them on a public hearing that I recall. They just come. The, the, the RFAB makes their decision, brings it before the commission, and we look them over and we approve them. So it, I think it's basically the same thing. I don't think we're, gonna, I don't think we're getting, I, that's what I remember after all these years. It's a great question, Mr. Zeta, obviously because there's a lot of money involved, but um, we deal with a lot of money anyway, day to day, and I think, but, but that's what we do. We do the plan first and do the procurement second, so. I, I've got, one question, maybe Dr. Neal and Mr. France and I sit also on the Chemical Fisheries Commission, and the question has come up and is still kind of hanging there, pertaining to the James River seed stock. What's the status at this juncture on the viability and capability of transferring any seed or providing any seed to the Potomac River? based on your analysis? What we've seen based on the most recent stock assessment survey of the seed areas is that the overall shell volume hasn't yet recovered to sort of when that harvest increased, but there has been good recruitment and we would anticipate seeing that translate to the full resource, including the shell baits that is dependent on, on sort of future harvest recovering. Um, in the spring survey possibly and definitely by the fall survey so i would anticipate having the best information for making a determination that it's in full recovery um after the spring survey so uh what i've been saying is that it would likely wouldn't be a staff recommendation to reopen those areas to out of state seed harvest per the condition of the resource they'll be very limited out of state as to where they go mm -hmm. it won't be you know, the lottery or lot is going to be where we need it to go, um, dedicated effort. Mm -hmm. And we'll be very judicious and cautious as to, but I have to ask, I mean, PRFC is, is kind of, if y'all remember, as, as far as their plans are concerned, I told them exactly I wasn't going to promise anything that we would be looking at that. That's kind of why I'm asking that question now. Mm -hmm. So I'm putting you out on a limb, but, and I want a cautious answer versus one that, that, uh, Okay, um, here's what we're going to do. Um, here's a rule that we can uh, move forward as far as the plan is concerned. If something does occur that we determine that it is not, that we have not done according to law, what we'll do is we will come back and we will correct it and we'll do it as we should. But at this juncture, um, the matter is before the commission for discuss for action as far as the plan. Mr. Tanker? I move that we approve the uh, 2020 oyster replenishment and restoration plan. As second. Second. second by Mr. Motion made by Mr. Tanker, second by Mr. Minor. Further discussion? 
All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? <coughs> motion carries. Now, the procurement of the motion should indicate that we will undertake the procurement uh, measures uh, pursuant to the laws of the Commonwealth of Virginia, is what the motion should be. Chair will entertain a motion. Mr. Tanker. I move to approve the procurement of the replenishment and restoration plan for 2020. Pursuant, pursuant to the laws of the Commonwealth of Virginia? Yes, pursuant okay. to the laws of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Is second that motion? Second. Second by Mr. Minor. Further discussion? All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. You're going to check when you get then with Ms. Crocker and y'all can get together if then make sure that we've done what we're supposed to do correctly because I don't want APA down here. Anyway. Just a, a comment on that. Yes, sir. And, you know, you've been here forever. Uh, Mr. Zedrin's right. question is, 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 is very viable, but this is how it's been done every year I've been on here. Correct. And, I mean, even, and so it's been done this for every year you've been on here, too. So I don't know where the lightning bolt hit you. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll also say, I mean, de definitely we need to check and make sure, but if someone wants to request a formal hearing before the commission on this, it's sure, a decision. Six. I don't see why they could. Yep. Okay. I understand where you're coming from. Good report. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Um, somebody got conditioned to bury it. Sherry, do you, do you control that air conditioner back there? I tried to turn it down a little bit. I think it, within a degree, we can. We need to turn it down some because I am about to fall out up here. It is hot. <laughs> Just another minute. Thank you. <laughs> Next item on the agenda, request for, look at the request for public hearing, 16, 17, 18. Mr. Kenyon. So this is a request for a public hearing for three issues. In, in the spirit of being more efficient, if you do look at your evaluation packet, I just want to point your attention towards a little bit different format. Instead of having three different evaluations in front of you, we've kind of combined them all onto one sheet to really give you what the public here, the request is for and a brief background about what it is. So we have three requests for public hearings going forward today. Uh, first one is for chapter four VAC 510 pertaining to Amberjack and Cobia, as well as chapter four VAC 610 pertaining to commercial fishing and mandatory harsh reporting. In August 2019, amendment one to the FMP for Cobia was approved. This really transitions commercial harvest and monitoring to the states. So to do this, we'll have to open up uh, chapter 610, which houses all our mandatory harvest reporting requirements. And we'll also have to open up Cobia to mirror this. This will also give us a mechanism that when that quota is reached, we have the availability to essentially close that fishery and mirror what's going on in the federal waters rather than coming back in front of the commission for action or even worse, an emergency amendment. The second one, item number 16, would be to establish a license fee for the commercial factual fishing license. We established the requirements for the fishery back in December 2019. This would be opening up chapter four VAC 1090 pertaining to license requirements and license fees to establish that license in regulation as well as that license fee. And the third item here is pertaining to black sea bass to establish a commercial black sea bass fishery quota for 2020. In October 2019, the catch and landing limits for black sea bass were approved. We are expecting that NOAA puts out the final rule for this beginning in March. So we can't actually adopt this till they put out their final rule. That's why we're requesting a public hearing now in anticipation of that in March. Well, um, we are in expecting a 59% increase compared to 2019. Uh, Virginia does own 20% of that coastwide quota. So staff is recommending the commission advertise for these agenda items 15 through 17 as you see. Um, I, is it, I, we, I, my, yeah, the our number's not updated. Correct. Sorry, these are for items six, um, 16, 17, and 18. Not that 15. is correct. Right? Correct. Any questions by members of the commission? What's the pleasure of the commission? 
Mr. Zadron. I move we approve the request for public hearing on these 16, 17, and 18. Motion made by Mr. Zadron. Is there a second to the motion? Second. Second by Mr. Minor. Further discussion? All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, all opposed? Motion carries. Anything else to come before this commission today? If not, thank you to the staff for the professional work they always do. Thank you to the commission members who serve diligently, professionally. It's just a privilege and an honor to be here. Meeting adjourned.